The growth of industrialization brought a new area of focus on how to increase production through efficient workforce management. One of the first theorists in this field was Frederick Taylor, who in the 1880s studied steel factories and their workflows, leading to his theory of scientific management, or Taylorism. This theory aimed to understand how a manufacturing line could become the most efficient, using empirical means to measure standardization, wastes, and best practices. Taylor's students, Henry Gantt and Max Weber, who evolved the theory in the 1930s, continued to face theoretical issues as they never fully considered human relations. Around this time, Edward Deming developed his 14 key principles of management, which emphasized quality and standardization with human relations. Deming's work was initially disregarded in the U.S., so he spent years in Japan rebuilding the country's infrastructure after World War II, transforming his work into total quality management TQM. In the late 1970s, U.S. Navy contractors adopted Deming's principles and aimed to create an environment of continuous improvement, which caught the attention of other government agencies striving for peak efficiency. In Japan, Toyota also had a similar epiphany in creating the Toyota Production System TPS, which consisted of 14 key leadership principles similar to Deming's principles. This later became the lean movement in the U.S., a culture of continuous improvement. Finally, the next wave of management efficiency came in the form of Six Sigma, developed by Motorola engineer Bill Smith in 1980. This philosophy aimed to identify, target, and eliminate manufacturing anomalies using statistical methods. General Electric GE, used this management tool to dominate multiple markets, increasing their operational efficiency and maximizing profits. In the 1990s, companies took a different approach to reducing costs and maximizing profits by outsourcing production to other countries. With the implementation of the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994, outsourcing took advantage of lower labor costs abroad. However, outsourcing also brought about logistical challenges and inefficiencies. It was only a temporary solution, and eventually, the trend of manufacturing returning to the United States became evident. This time, however, it would be powered by automation and robotics, eliminating the need for human labor and the associated human factors that can impact efficiency. The future of manufacturing is no longer a human-driven event. With advancements in technology, we are moving towards a world where peak efficiency will be achieved through the elimination of human factors. The goal of scientific management and the drive for efficiency will continue, but with a new approach focused on automation. The mid-20th century was characterized by a clear separation between blue-collar and white-collar jobs. People either worked with their hands or worked behind a desk. In 1959, Peter Drucker introduced the term knowledge worker in his book, The Landmarks of Tomorrow. He defined these workers as people who think for a living, such as doctors, lawyers, accountants, and architects. These were jobs that required creative thought and unique insights. With the progress of time and the evolution of work, more jobs shifted from manual to office work. A new classification emerged, one that is neither blue-collar nor knowledge work, white-collar manufacturing. These are office jobs that are process-driven and repetitive and have limited opportunities for independent judgment. In many cases, these roles are considered knowledge worker positions but management structures have limited their judgment through centralized control. Management structures are put in place in white-collar manufacturing to maximize efficiency. Production is monitored, time is measured, and metrics are established to monitor performance. However, this environment can lead to fear among the workforce, as these positions may eventually be outsourced or automated. On the other hand, true knowledge workers are those who apply innovative thought using approaches that cannot be governed by performance metrics. Not all knowledge worker activities can be classified as knowledge work. They must also endure non-value-adding activities such as meetings, coordination, newsletters, status updates, time cards, vacation tracking, performance appraisals, and so on. An enlightened organization recognizes that these activities provide little to no value and therefore actively attempts to outsource, automate, or eliminate them to create greater capacity for the knowledge worker to experiment learn, create, and build future customer value. It takes a seasoned and enlightened leader to distinguish between a knowledge worker and a white-collar manufacturer. The organization must treat knowledge workers differently, and management best practices should elicit greater control over white-collar workers 
However, applying the same productivity paradigm to knowledge workers as Frederick Taylor did to factory workers stunts the long-term productivity of the organization. The misapplication of productivity metrics by considering all knowledge work as a production environment can be a silent killer in the organization. It takes a trained management attribute of control to find leaders who can restrain from demanding immediate results and have the patience and ability to navigate ambiguity for long-term success. Let's look at the humble beginnings of two iconic brands, Henry John Hines and James Kraft. Henry John Hines was a first-generation immigrant who started a small family business in 1876, bringing the American staple of ketchup to the market. James Kraft, on the other hand, started a door-to-door -door cheese business in the early 1900s, revolutionizing the cheese industry with his innovative pasteurization process. Fast forward to 2015, when these two brands merged to become the fifth largest food manufacturer in the world, with annual sales of over $26 billion. The objective behind the merger was to capitalize on economies of scale, reduce waste, and create a profit windfall. To achieve this, the company employed a rigorous zero-based budgeting process, where every dollar spent had to be justified. This resulted in over $1.7 billion in operating cost savings and an extremely efficient supply chain. However, this focus on cost-cutting and efficiency proved to be short-sighted. The company's product portfolio was aging, and they failed to invest in research and development, leading to a decline in sales and market share. In early 2019, the company's stock plummeted by 27% or $12.6 billion in one day because they failed to meet market projections. The story of Kraft Heinz is a cautionary tale about the dangers of taking efficiency to the extreme. While cost-cutting measures may seem like the right solution in the short term, they can lead to long-term consequences, such as a lack of innovation and a decline in market share. The solution for Kraft Heinz was counterintuitive. The company needed to invest in product development and innovation to re-energize its business. This highlights the importance of balancing efficiency with innovation in any strategic merger or acquisition.